So cool, in the interest of time, we're just going to kind of move on to some red wines. Um, since we have five of them, uh, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time here. But again, so some generic guidelines to think about when we approach Bordeaux as a whole. Again, we're walking into a restaurant. We're sitting down with the wine list. I love this context. Now, um, where we see they have left bank on the menu and right bank on the menu. Okay, what does that mean? That's not a grape varietal. It's, it's an area in Bordeaux. Left bank, generally speaking, is very gravelly. This is a lot of the area where the Dutch came in and unearthed these giant gravel uh, croups. They call, uh, they're basically gravel piles. And a lot of the great chateaus on the left bank um, are built upon these, these gra you know, kind of gravelly uh, outcroppings. Um, so you have Cabernet Sauvignon. And again, Cabernet loves having drainage. It loves having its feet dry. It can just sit there. Uh, gravel tends to be a warmer soil um, because it absorbs sun during the day and can reflect it back up uh, gradually at night. A little bit of Merlot um, planted here and there. It's about 30% or so. And then you'll see some Cabernet Franc and some Petit Verdot um, you know, kind of taking that role as well. You move to the right bank. Saint Emilion and Pomerol, much more clay-based and limestone-based soils. This is where water gets retained. And again, Merlot loves having its feet wet. Merlot takes center stage. In fact, the second most popular grape isn't Cabernet Sauvignon. It's Cabernet Franc. So Cabernet Franc tends to be, it enjoys a cooler climate. Um, it's a shorter ripening season. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of uh, kind of hedging your bets here because um, Merlot will ripen a little bit after Cabernet Franc. So if you're on the right bank and it's too wet, and your Merlot, Merlot gets kind of rotten, or you know, maybe the vin, you know, it just doesn't quite get ripe enough, Cabernet Franc is a pretty reliable blending partner to have in there, which is why they go very, very well together. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some family history. Um, and uh, you know, everyone always is surprised when I put the family history of Bordeaux, red grape varietals, leading off with Cabernet Franc. Um, because it's such a, in most people's minds, an unimportant grape varietal. It's an accessory. It's a blending grape. Sure, there are some great wines like Cheval Blanc, which makes a lot, a high percentage of Cabernet Franc in their wine. But why does Cabernet Franc always start at the top here? Um, it's because once upon a time, and this is only about three, four, five hundred years ago, um, Cabernet Sauvignon didn't exist. Believe it or not, there was a time on this planet where Cabernet Sauvignon did not exist. What a very sad time. It's unbelievable. Um, but kind of like, you know, kind of like children, um, you know, so, you know when you cross different grape varietals, you get different expressions no matter what. You can never repeat the same expression of a crossing um, unless it's just unbelievable luck. Um, so what happened is you had people that were you know, cross-pollinating Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc, and all of a sudden you had this new grape varietal pop up that was thicker skinned, uh, more pigmented, uh, and did really, really well in this area, and that was Cabernet Sauvignon. But that kind of leaves away uh, kind of the other half of the, uh, the equation here. And you have this grape varietal called Magdalene Noir, which is not used in quality wine production, but because, again, this was four, five, six hundred years ago, you had, you know, you had Magdalene Noir around that was just being grown and being made into wine because people didn't know any better, and they crossed and they became Merlot. So it's like you have two different offspring of Cabernet Franc, um, and this is why Cabernet Franc is critically important to the survival of Bordeaux, because without it, all these other grape varietals would never have existed. And the other grape varietals I put down here, and again, it's, I apologize for those in the back, you can't see it, but Petit Verdot and Malbec. Uh, Petit Verdot, we have no idea actually where it came from. Um, it just kind of appeared one day. Uh, we think it came from the Pyrenees, where a lot of different grape varietals came from, and um, the history is very, very uncertain. And then you have Malbec, which is actually a half-sibling a half of, of Merlot uh, with Magdalene Noir, but blended with Prunelard, another minor grape varietal. So there's a lot of kind of, you know, kind of similarities between all these grapes. They are related. Um, there is a lot of, you know, kind of, well, yeah, Merlot tastes like Malbec. You put a, a varietal Merlot up against a varietal Malbec, say like Merlot from California and Malbec from Argentina, there's a lot of similarities. And this is why all these grapes go so well together, because there's enough crossover between one varietal and the next. And now we're talking about unique differences in things like Cabernet Franc, which can be a little bit more green and vegetal. Cabernet Sauvignon should be a little more dark and kind of brooding. Merlot, which is more red and black fruit. Uh, Petit Verdot, which is spicy. Malbec, which is buoyant and happy and joyful. Carbonara, which is again kind of green and a little bit more kind of weedy and smoky. You blend all these things together and you get, it's like a chef in the kitchen. Now you get something amazing. Well, how'd you do it? Well, I don't know. I just kind of threw it all together and saw what happened. Fortunately, people started writing down recipes and how has it started coming up with formulas of their wine. Um, and this is why, again, the Bordelais have always been very smart. They've never put all of their eggs in one basket. They've never banked upon one grape varietal to carry them. Um, it's always been about blending because from vintage to vintage, they are guaranteed asterisk, uh, to get a fairly consistent, reliable product. And that's really what a lot of people want in the world. 
We love Starbucks around every corner. We want, we want reliability, especially when we spend money on wine. We want, to, we want to be good. There's nothing wrong with that. And Bordeaux realized that a lot earlier than a lot of other people. So here again, we're moving to the left bank first for our first couple of wines. Uh, it's uh, three, four, and five. Um, so again, left bank, um, we'll focus on this in, our, in, a, in a following seminar, but up here in the Midoc, uh, this is generally thought of lower quality. It's closer to the Atlantic, a little bit more marshy. Um, you get a little bit too much ocean influence here. But again, you're going to see some vineyards popping up here with very uh, respectable quality wines. And then you get into the Haute Medoc, which encompasses most of your high quality uh, villages, communes, and appellations on the left bank. The further south you go, the more inland you get. Uh, the less you know, kind of buffeted you are by the ocean, um, and also you get a little bit less of that marshland. Uh, you move a little more to hard gravel and stone as you get down to Pessac Leonion. So here is wines three, four, and five. Um, so again, we'll kind of walk through these. Um, wine number three is again something that's quite you know, again very humble. Um, there's a lot of inexpensive Bordeaux out there, but I find that this producer Chateau Grezac always does very well. Despite the vintage, despite the price point, it always delivers a very reliable wine. It is relied on, it is, does rely on Merlot, and it is from the Medoc. So again, moving back a slide, we saw the Medoc up to the north. What I say the Medoc had more of than the rest of? It has more marshland. It's wetter up here. What does Cabernet hate? Wet. This is why Merlot does best up here in the Medoc. This is why Chateau Graysac uses almost two-thirds Merlot, even though it's on the left bank. So everything I talked about being left bank Cabernet, uh, forget that for now. So here we go. Chateau Graysac, on the nose, what do we smell? Leather. Coffee, leather. Here's some cheat sheet for you. Graphite. Graphite. Plum. And think Merlot. Merlot is a little bit more of a buoyant, softer fruit. I mean, it's a little bit more kind of happy and cheerful than Cabernet. Cabernet always seems to be kind of either angry and storming around um, and very dark. Um, but Merlot always has a little bit more buoyancy to it. Mix of red and black fruit, so plum and cherries. Forest floor, mushrooms. Yeah, even, again, a very humble wine. This is a Cru Bourgeois. Uh, it's $16.99 or so, plus or minus a couple of dollars. Um, but it really shows off, I think, what Merlot does well in Bordeaux, and that's deliver, again, friendly wine, approachable wine, soft, plump. Framed with tannin, certainly, because we get 30% Cabernet. So Cabernet is not totally blown out of the water here by the Merlot. You still get the structure. You still get that dark fruit. You still get the tannins. Um, you still get kind of the echo of what Cabernet Sauvignon is all about, even though Merlot is certainly the lead role. And then a little bit of Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot. Using it like, you know, like a chef would use salt and pepper in the kitchen or some herbs and spices, just to give a little bit more accent to flavor. So now when we taste the wine, does it taste similar? Does it taste different? For me, mocha, black plum, almost a liqueur, almost a liqueur note. Yeah, black fruits, black berries, black licorice. Yeah. I mean, this, we're talking about a lot of complexity for this wine. And again, that's the benefit of using four different grape varietals. They embrace this idea of, again, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Um, a lot of, again, in California, they run away from that idea. They want to display the grape varietal proudly, even though they might be blending in other things, because they want people to think, this is what Cabernet tastes like. This is what Merlot tastes like. Bordeaux is like, we're just going to make our wine. This is our chateau profile. Our wine's going to taste like our wine. That's all we want it to taste like. Vintage to vintage consistency. So uh, wine number two here, or sorry, wine number four, uh, 2005 Grand Puy Lacoste. This was parted with very, very um, uh, cheapishly by Angelo. Um, I asked him for this wine. He's like, well, that's not even ready to go yet. It's 2005, and it's amazing. Um, but in terms of the power and prestige of what Cabernet Sauvignon delivers, I think it's important to taste wine even when it's not quite at its, quote, best. Because it's important to see the varietal, important to see the structure, which then allows you to actually age wine for decades. Um, because right now, I mean, if we just kept this in the cellar for another 10, 15 years, it would be great. But would we ever see the power of what Cabernet Sauvignon brings to the table and why these wines are so age-worthy? So when we smell this wine, for me, you lost that really playful note, that kind of almost kind of jubilant red fruit um, from the gray sack. And now it's much more dark, dark tones, black fruit, bramble fruit, black raspberry, uh, black plum, black cherry, licorice. 
you know, again, a little bit more of that, that cassis, creme de cassis, chambord. Um, things that are just big and rich and, you know, almost stewed in terms of their quality. Um, that's, again, that's, that's Cabernet Sauvignon. To keep it from becoming too overpowering, to keep it from becoming too tannic, they do blend in Merlot. Um, and in 2005, you had, you know, basically a, a spectacular vintage where everything ripened perfectly. You had all, basically your entire arsenal at your disposal to make wine that you felt lived up to the standards of your chateau. So they decided to eliminate any sort of other accessory varietal. Their quality of their Cabernet and Merlot, they felt was enough. Because it is common to have a couple of percent of Petit Verdot, a couple of percent of Cabernet Franc. They decided this was the best way to go, showing off Cabernet and Merlot side by side. So cool. Uh, so that was the 05 Grand Puy Lacoste. And then we have something um, really fun here. Um, not that all the wines aren't fun, but uh, 1996. And now we start to see a little bit of age um, coming here on the wine. Um, Chateau Lagrange and St. Julien. A little bit reduced in terms of Cabernet. Um, certainly not the blockbuster vintage of 05. Um, you know, maybe not even considered one of the top two vintages of the decade, but I think the wines um, in these kind of quote off vintages or more challenging vintages, I think age um, a little bit more interestingly at a quicker pace. So we're 21 years of age here. Again, we see Cabernet, uh, about a third Merlot, a little bit of Petit Verdot. And again, your little cheat sheet here uh, between red grapes and, and uh, kind of so with oak and with age, start to see more of those age notes. It's things like soy, leather, uh, mushrooms, tobacco, dried herbs. Um, you get a little bit more, again, oxidation starts to take place. And if the wine has enough fruit, has enough tannin, the tannin will actually serve as a protectant. It will bind with oxygen before it actually allows the wine to oxidize and become kind of over the hill. Bell pepper. I like bell pepper. Bell pepper is a fantastic uh, benchmark for Cabernet Sauvignon, especially in less ripe vintages, especially with a little bit of uh, Cabernet uh, Franc thrown in there. What else do we smell on the nose here? Leather. Leather. You know, almost like a mix of... Yeah, a good barnyard smell. Yeah, like a, like a, a saddle, um, you, know, you know, some sort of, you know, some sort of like, a, like a new leather shoe, maybe just lightly worn. How about on the palate? What do we taste? Is it any different? Is it similar? Black pepper corn or green bell pepper? Green bell pepper. Does everybody kind of get that green bell pepper note? It's something very, very unique to Bordeaux and Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Again, you look at the parentage. Um, you know, again, Cabernet Franc begat Cabernet Sauvignon. There's this very, it's a chemical compound called a pyrazine, which go and cut a green bell pepper, go and roast a green bell pepper over a fire. And again, how, who's smelled a green bell pepper before? Intentionally. Yeah, I mean, uh, not, not many of us. Three, four, five of us. You know, I, I, I think you've never really experienced wine until you've gotten kicked out of a grocery store for walking around smelling all the fruit and vegetables. Um, but yeah, I mean, smell bell pepper. It really is there. And again, it's a chemical compound in Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc that is unique and is a benchmark, really, for what, you know, kind of, again, Bordeaux wine, because of that moderate climate, it's not as hot as Napa. Napa can't get pyrazines like this. Napa can't get that bell pepper. This is why Bordeaux is always identifiable and has this additional kind of herbal uh, complexity. So, wine number six, the Chateau d'Asseau, 2000, larger regards, a fantastic vintage. 65% Merlot, 30% Cabernet Franc, 5% Cabernet Sauvignon. Jumping back to our cheat sheet here, what are some aromas that we get off of wine number six? Plum. Fresh plum or dried plum? Both. Absolutely. This is a great vintage. 2000 is a great vintage. There's a lot of ripe fruit. Um, there's also a balance of acidity. There's also some new oak here. Again, new oak helps to protect the wine, so you actually, 17 years in, can get a balance of ripe, fresh, and starting to oxidize dried fruit. It's one of the joys of tasting these wines over their lifespan. You get this kind of crossover of youth and maturity. Floral note, blackberries. What kind of, yeah, floral. For me, Merlot is always much prettier than Cabernet Sauvignon. It's much more aromatic. Things like violets and roses. Um, a lot more floral nature here in, in, in Merlot. Um, and again, it's, it's just a little bit lighter in style. There's a lot more red fruit, so it often kind of dances across the palate, where again, Cabernet Sauvignon kind of stomps its way through because it's heavier and bolder and more powerful. 
And I put down here Merlot is overrated till it's underrated. Uh, Merlot kind of has this vacillation between it's, it's something I don't want to grow because everybody grows it and then, oh, I really want to grow it because it's amazing. Um, it, it, no one really quite knows what to make of Merlot despite the fact it's grown in some of the most you know, expensive and noble uh, land in all of Bordeaux. Um, and then Cabernet Franc, hey, I was mentioned in Sideways, it's always a supporting cast member in Bordeaux. It's always the grape file that kind of gets forgotten, but provides acidity, provides structure, provides balance um, to a lot of the riper, juicier flavors, certainly of Merlot. So uh, wine number seven is the Croix St. George. It is Pomerol. A lot more iron in the soil in Pomerol. Um, so it is clay-based, but there is a, a very a redness to the soil here. So if you taste something like iron or kind of like a, a meatiness to the wine, absolutely. That's a, that's a benchmark of Pomerol, how you differentiate between uh, saint Emilion and Pomerol is that, that iron, that kind of really kind of minerality there. Um, but again, we're 95% Merlot now. We're really more about purity of varietal um, in Pomerol. Um, it, you often will find a lot more dominant, you know, if not 100%, very, very close to 100% varietal wines in Pomerol. Merlot just does very, very well here. And it's their benchmark. It provides that, again, grace, that suppleness, that ripeness, that polish of tannin, that oftentimes you have to blend a bunch of different grapes in to get that finished product. All right, what do we think about wine number seven? The, uh, the Croix St. George. Different, similar? Did I catch wine? I'm thirsty. Some people? No? Different. Different good, different bad, different how? Yeah. Softer, riper, um, kind of a, a nice, a more subtle, graceful entrance, and then powerful tannin. Saint Emilion has more limestone. Limestone gives it a little bit more aggressiveness. Again, this iron gives it a little bit more kind of suppleness and roundness. All right, so uh, our final wine here. Can we go back to our old friend here? Who remembers the name of this? Nastiness, Botrytis, Noble Rot. So wine number eight. I'm pretty sure that's the only wine left. It is number eight. Um, so now we're going to talk about again. Again, this is a Botrytis affected wine. This is one of the um, I say this with all the love in the world, the freak shows of Mother Nature. There is no explanation as why this tastes good. There is no explanation of why this actually you know, happens other than sheer luck. Um, they say you have to be a special kind of crazy to make Botrytis affected wines anywhere in the world because you can't control it, you can't predict it. It is 100% up to Mother Nature. Um, people have tried to inoculate fruit with Botrytis. They've tried to do it in sterile environments with some success, but to have it occur in nature, uh, certainly one of those most unique experiences. So we have 2003 Chateau La Tour Blanche. This was a, a warm vintage, and because oftentimes warm doesn't necessarily equate to quality white grapes, um, warm does not exclude humidity. And what is required for Botrytis is actually humidity. So you can have a warm vintage and it won't, you know, it actually might be a, a, su a superb vintage for Sauterne and Botrytis affected wines. So again, back to our little cheat sheet here. Totally different flavors than we're even gonna talk about with our first two white wines because we have this concentration and oxidation and raisination here on the vine. So tasting this. What do we smell? What do we taste? Syrup. Honey. Honey, syrup. I mean, it's sticky, it's waxy, orange, orange blossom, marmalade. Pineapples, mangoes. Relative, it feels low acidity. So the, the, the comment was, this is low acidity. In its, in its palate, that acid gets wiped out. If it, did, if it had low acidity, this would be flabby, it would be sticky, it would be over the top. But because of that concentration of acidity, now it actually is a little bit cleaner, a little bit fresher than it actually perceives to be. Yeah, lower, absolutely. But because it's riper, but then the concentration, it kind of actually finds a stability that's pretty close to actually in acid to what we had before. All right, so we're actually pretty good to being right on schedule, so um, I'm kind of impressed by that. Um, was there any, any, other, uh, any other questions before we kind of wrap things up? Is yes, in the back, sir. Two questions on Sauterne. Yes. 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 Yes.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent question. So one is, does Sauterne age longer than red or white? And two, does it become actually less sweet over time? So answer to question number one, yes. Just because of what is going on in Sauterne, you have higher acid, you have generally uh, some new oak, and then you have sugar. Those are three protective elements in the wine. That, you know, basically you have the other two, certainly if you have new oak and acidity in reds and whites, but you don't have sugar. Sugar is a great protectant of wine. That's why some of the longest lived wines have high levels of sugar. Um, so, and then, sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. The second part is, do they get less sweet? Less sweet, yes. So the perception of sweetness will mellow out over time. I mean, it's impossible for the sugar to actually go away, but the complexity, um, you will get some sugar actually precipitate out with the tartrates. Um, so as you see those little wine diamonds, there will be some sugar locked up in there. So you will actually lose a little bit of sweetness over time, but it does tend to gain a, a bit more of a lusciousness and viscosity. And bonus question. Bonus question. Barsack. Barsack. So the question is, um, Barsack and Sauterne. So, Barsac is a commune that is right next door to Sauterne, um, basically right on the Cirone River. Um, so you have Sauterne, you have Barsac. Both can be labeled under AOC Sauterne. But um, Sauterne is the, mo is the more prestigious. Barsac is, you know, again, it's under the classification. It's under the, um, the appellation. People kind of think of Sauterne as being higher quality. I, I, don't, I won't argue one way or the other. Uh, it's just more of a perception thing. But Barsac can be labeled as Sauterne. So, there's a question right down here, yes? Um, uh, they've been in the glass for about two, three hours? Right uh, we poured the, we decanted these wines uh, at five o'clock. We started the decanting, so between five and six. Which of these would have the biggest, best, or negative effect? So the question was, which wine would have the biggest effect um, for aeration and decanting? And I would say it would have to be the 2005 Grand Puy Lacoste because it's the youngest, or not the youngest, but it has the most density, it's the tightest, uh, most tightly wound wine. The more oxygen that wine can get in the glass, the better. Um, the wine that probably did not need as much would be the 96 Lagrange, Lagrange, um, or the, uh, the 2000. Uh, you know, it's, I, you know, again, it, it, uh, the Dasso. Um, again, the older the wine gets, the less you want to shake it up and you know, aerate it, because um, it'll start to help it fall apart. 